Okay, so uh, Dr. Failings is uh, director of the Crimble Neuroscience Center at the uh, Toronto Western Hospital and heads the spinal cord program at Toronto West, uh, there, uh, at, which is part of the University Health Network. He's a professor of neurosurgery and uh, holds the Gerald and Tootsie Helbert Chair in Neural Repair and Regeneration and is uh, also a scientist at the McEwen Center of Regenerative Med Medicine and a McLaughlin Scholar in Molecular Medicine. He is a very active clinician focused on complex spinal cord surgery, but also is in, has a transitional uh, research program that uh, he is uh, focused on novel treatments for injured brain and in spinal cord, of course. He has numerous prestigious awards, which I will not go through all of them, but the gold medal in surgery is certainly from the Royal College of Physicians, is certainly a, a very important one, and also has a, um, a, an award from um, or is it here, the uh, uh, Reeve Irvine Research uh, Medal in Spinal Cord Injury. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Failings and uh, let him take up his, his podium here. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, just while I'm finding my talk, well, it's a real um, honor and, uh, and pleasure to be here at the Alan Taylor um, uh, symposium and uh, what a wonderful day it is for spinal cord injury research and to recognize uh, Reggie Edgerton has made a huge contribution and for me it's very special here because um, I'm here really amongst uh, friends and it's great to be here um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with Lynn and with uh, Greg and with Arthur and it's, uh, that, that for me is particularly special. So. Um, the story I'm going to talk about is, I think, complementary to uh, some of the previous uh, presentations, but I'm going to give it my own little, little twist. And really, I'm going to make the point that uh, we need to be focusing on cervical injuries, we need to be thinking about the chronic lesion, and that no single treatment is going to be uh, sufficient. And certainly, the heterogeneity of spinal cord injury is quite uh, daunting. And I'm going to try to make the case that if we're thinking about uh, surgical strategies to influence repair and regeneration of the intraspinal cord, the combination of thinking about a, a cellular therapy, and our approach is with neural stem cells, and bioengineered approaches may make uh, uh, some, some sense. So I bring greetings from, uh, from, from Toronto. This is where I work at the Criminal uh, Neuroscience uh, Centre, and I want to acknowledge right at the outset that uh, really everything that I'm going to be presenting is the product of either collaborations with various um, uh, in investigators, including uh, my mentor Charles Tatter, or with, uh, with the students, and I want to also acknowledge the various uh, uh, funders. And this is a picture here, and this is actually taken at our, at our annual uh, at the Tatter Turnbull uh, Symposium, and I want to also uh, recognize Barb Turnbull, who is here as a dear friend honoring a barb in a few weeks' time um, as well, and Reggie Edgerton, of course, is a previous Tatter Terminal a speaker as well. So let's just talk about the reality of uh, spinal cord injury, and, um, you know, this is uh, not something that anybody really wants. Uh, the people that I treat don't even know they're going to have a spinal cord injury, and then suddenly this occurs. This is um, a patient that I looked after as a best friend of one of our radiologists. They were vacationing dove into water and things didn't turn out well. This is what a C4-5 bilateral facet dislocation looks like. This is what happens when somebody breaks their neck. That's what the MRI looks like. It's a severe, compressive, contusive uh, lesion. And, sp and spinal cord injury is very heterogeneous, and that is one of the challenges for us to deal with. So I'm going to talk about the cervical injury a bit, the challenges of the chronic lesion. I'm actually going to quote some of Wolf Tesla's work. And I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities and also some of the real limitations of neural stem cells. Um, and then uh, talk a bit about some various uh, bioengineered strategies to either target the real scar, to use various uh, engineered substrates to, uh, for scaffolds. And then um, I couldn't resist just talking a little bit about um, the, the, the clinical trial that we had done. And to date, it's really the only published uh, a bioengineered strategy that it's, that's made it into some kind of clinical application, and then this is with the row inhibition story. 
Uh, spinal cord injury is commoner than we, than we think it is, and um, the prevalence is probably around, around 1.4 million in, in, the, in the U.S. And uh, the, the old statistics just didn't make sense from an epidemiological perspective. If people are surviving uh, injuries and we have this constant uh, number of people, how come the prevalence wasn't changing since articles published in the 1960s? And in fact, the prevalence is higher. It's about 1.4 million in the U.S. Two-thirds of injuries are at the cervical level, the most common levels at C5-6, uh, and so the impact on hand function is quite, is quite profound. And, and this has a big impact on people's independence. This is what a, a chronic lesion looks like. This is human pathology tissue. And you'll note there's a significant loss of tissue, but the cord is not actually physically transected, but um, it kind of eventually gets to almost a virtual transection. But um, the fact that there is physical continuity it does present some interesting opportunities and challenges. There's a significant cavitation, and this, of course, is a challenge, and there's a glial scar. And so intrinsically, there's a loss of the conduit for repair. There clearly is a loss of critical cells, and there is demyelination of residual axons. And as Wolf had implied, the relative importance of these different aspects will vary from individual to individual, but there are some patterns of injury that we're beginning to, uh, to, beginning to, to recognize. I want to just put a plug in for uh, the Journal of Neurotrauma uh, uh, issue from about a year ago, and in particular, this is uh, Wolf Teslab's article on cellular transportation uh, therapies. And there are different pearls, I think, from, from this article, but there, there are three things, I think, that are, are important to recognize. One is that you know, if you want to go into clinical trials and if you want to study cervical injury, it probably makes sense to study cervical injury preclinical models, that kind of makes sense. And that um, if, if uh, we're trying to target the 1.4 million people in North America that have a chronic injury, then maybe we ought to study the chronic injury. So that is kind of important to do. And also we recognize that the spinal cord injury is pretty complicated and maybe the idea that we can home run with one type of a therapy, that may not be smart. And maybe we need to start looking at combinatorial therapies. And uh, cells uh, work in different ways, and uh, they're, they're heterogeneous. But I guess in some regards, you can simplify this. They may spare tissue. They may replace cells, and they may not harm the environment. And, and, and these come in all kinds of different flavors, and there are various advantages and disadvantages to these. Some are autogenous, some are not. Some are true stem cells, some are not. Wolf has talked about Schwann cells and skin-derived precursor cells. Our approach is to use neural stem cells. And this isn't to say one is better than the other. They're different. And our approach has really been mainly focused on the remyelination story. This kind of builds on my own uh, work related to the discomplete uh, injury and, and, and the, the concept of the subheal rim of spare tissue. But I fully acknowledge that this won't work in all, in all patients. Okay, so the basic uh, strategy to the remyelination concept is just kind of shown in this, in this uh, uh, video. So we have myelinated axons in the spinal cord. They signal action potentials through the nodes of Ranvier. We have clusters of sodium channels here. The oligate endocytes um, will myelinate several axons in the central nervous system. Uh, there's, a, there's a critical molecular arrangement at the node of Ranvier in the juxtaparanormal region. Casper and potassium channels next door to the node of Ranvier. Okay, so in the majority of people with spinal cord injury, including the patient that I showed, what you see is a massive central hemorrhage. There is a contusion, there's central necrosis that occurs, and that's primary injury. And then there's this demyelinated rim of axons to the periphery due to apoptosis of the oligodendrocytes, and there's a very incomplete remyelination. This causes a disturbance in the molecular arrangement of these axons. And so then the basic concept behind remyelination therapy is you use the intrinsic scaffolding of the host cord. You go in with a precursor cell, like a neural stem cell, and then it pathfinds along the white matter, and that um, through the intrinsic properties of these neural stem cells, it will turn into oligodendrocytes and then remyelinate these axons. 
And, and there actually is reasonable evidence from the preclinical literature to, to support this. And I'll go over this evidence uh, uh, briefly. But of course, there are also several caveats and assumptions with this, right? So one of the challenges is, can we actually measure demyelination in the human spinal cord? And that's not trivial. That is not easy uh, to do. And so you know, we need to be thinking about linking the, the imaging studies as well with this. I'm, I'm seeing Ravi Menon nodding his head up there. And that, you know, this is an important uh, component. And I won't talk about that at all today in my talk for sake of time. One of the big discoveries that, had, that has occurred, which is, which is, I'm proud to say, a Canadian discovery, uh, relates to the presence of neural stem cells in the adult uh, brain. This is Sam Weiss's work. Derek Vanderpoise had a big contribution. Um, and we take advantage of this in our animal models. We take um, uh, uh, transgenic mice that express yellow or green fluorescent protein, and then we can derive the neural stem cells from the periventricular region, and using the neurosphere assay developed by Weiss and Reynolds, we can isolate these and we can play various tricks in culture to make different types of uh, uh, adult nerve cells, and our main focus has been on oligodendrocytes for the reasons that I've, that I've indicated. And there are some um, uh, innovative approaches now using tricks from the developmental biology to make the process uh, simpler. So it turns out that you actually don't need to go through the classical embryoid body uh, formation to, uh, to make um, adult neural uh, stem cells. And this may have interesting implications around the clinical uh, uh, translation, particularly if we start looking at um, um, IPS types of uh, cells. And this is um, a, a paper that we did in collaboration with Derek Vanderkoy where we showed that we did not have to go through the embryoid uh, body process at all to create um, neural, neural stem cells from either embryonic stem cells or IPS cells. And here, we take advantage of the fact that embryonic stem cells in development actually want to make nerve cells. You actually don't have to do a lot of changes. You have to do a few things. We have to provide uh, a LIF, FGF2, and a few other things in culture. But in principle, we can get these nurses fairly simply um, and um, through some other um, through some other modifications, we can get, then get adult uh, neural stem cells. And this is really what we want. We want an adult phenotype because we don't want these to revert back to a pluripotent um, embryonic type because that's where you get into trouble with teratoma formation and so on. And so this, this is just um, a few pictures um, from, uh, uh, from um, uh, uh, our lab's work just showing the formation of these, um, of these stem cells. This is James Rowland's PhD work. Um, so, one of the cool things that uh, I benefit from in, in Toronto is uh, some wonderful collaborators. I mentioned uh, Derek Vanderkoy, this is Andres Naji. And Andres um, had a pretty important paper that came out um, in Nature, uh, I guess about two years ago. And really what he did was, he took advantage of Yamanaka's seminal uh, discovery, and of course Yamanaka won the Nobel this year for the discovery of these critical transcription factors that can transform somatic cells into a primitive form called the IPS cell. The challenge with trying to take that in the clinic, though, is that the classical Yamanaka approach requires viruses. So that could be a problem if you're trying uh, to, to, um, uh, to generate uh, stem cells and cultures where you may be looking at hundreds, if not thousands, of, of, of cell divisions. And so Najee's approach is to use a non-viral technique of uh, using a piggyback transposon cassette. And so we're routinely now using this with human uh, neural stem cells in culture in the preclinical um, animal models where we deliver um, Yamanaka's reprogramming factors using a non-viral approach. And then we can ligate out the, uh, the piggyback transposon cassette without um, any uh, genetic uh, signature. And then using um, uh, Vanderkoy's uh, default approach, we can then develop uh, adult neural stem cells. And so we think that this could be a pathway where realistically we might be able to take autogenous IPS cells and potentially make neural stem cells. So this is still at the proof of concept uh, a phase in that there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of um, of being able to uh, ramp this up where you get sufficient quantities of cells to make this a clinical reality. But nonetheless, in concept, this is, this is pretty promising. 
And as uh, Wolfram had alluded to, um, we use a shiver or mouse uh, model. The shiver uh, is deficient <coughs> in myelin basic protein, and we use this as a proof of concept uh, 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 model. And this is just a, a bit of work just showing um, uh, the, the fact that we can get a beautiful remyelination in, in these um, uh, 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 developmentally deficient uh, uh, mice with either uh, ES derived or IPS derived neuro neural stem cells. And we can get reconstruction of the nose, the remyelination, and, uh, and so on. So let's come back to the chronic uh, uh, lesion. And I think it's important to keep thinking about this because I really just talked about one mechanism. Sometimes, you know, you look at your data and you get so enamored of your data, you think that, you know, that the science is so beautiful, I'm so smart, it's so wonderful. And then you start looking at this and you start thinking, well, that's really great failings. You know, you've, you've dealt with like maybe one you know, tenth of what's going on here. And this is the challenge, right? And I think it's important to keep coming back uh, to this. So a few uh, speakers have alluded to this uh, issue of the, of the glial scar. And, um, and so here, this is um, uh, some work from a former postdoc, Sohila Karimi. Um, and this is uh, just some stains for chondroitin sulfate uh, proteoglycans. And so um, uh, a lot of people focused on some of the the cool things in the, in, the, in the journal neuroscience paper that we had on the impact of neural stem cells, but probably some of the most important data were actually the negative results that we reported. We, we showed that, at least in our hands, the neural stem cells didn't work very well in the chronic lesion. And this is a supplementary figure, but we basically showed that we, we thought that the glial scar was, was, a, was a significant player here and that in, in this setting, it seemed that, that the, um, the glial scar was inhibiting the differentiation and migration of these little stem cells. So taking advantage of James Fawcett's work, we then thought, well, let's try chondroitinase and you can dramatically knock down the glial scar. And if you do this, now the neural stem cells uh, migrate. And this is, I think, one of the first examples of the combined use of a, if you will, a bioengineered strategy, say with chondroitinase and use of neural stem cells. And I think now we're trying to target, you know, a couple of aspects of the pathobiology. Uh, and to me, this seems, this kind of an approach seems to make sense. And if we're going to start thinking about the use of cellular therapies in people with chronic lesions, I think we, we, we need to at least address some of the pathobiology of the chronic uh, lesion, and these are just some pictures showing the myelination and we have nice behavioral impact. So these are published data, and I, I won't go over in too much detail. So let's come back again to this. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the cell replacement and some of the other aspects of what the stem cells <coughs> might do, but what about this cavity, and what about the lack of a conduit for repair? So that's really awkward to deal with, isn't it? It's not like the stem cells just jump across this cavity. The cavity itself completely is devoid of blood vessels, and there's no way that these cells are going to survive if you put them right into the cavity. That makes no sense at all. So how are we going to try to overcome this? And this is where bioengineered strategies make sense. But I have to tell you, I have a problem with, say, just dividing the spinal cord, taking a chunk out and then putting a plastic tube there in the middle. And I'm kind of worried that, you know, gee, what if there actually is some functional tissue in that spinal cord? And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it's just me that has a problem with it, but I kind of don't like that idea. However, there are some cool tricks now that the engineers are coming up with. And one of them that I think is really cool are these self-assembling peptides. And so this is a technology that I got exposed to through a, a collaboration with uh, uh, Jack Kessler, who's a senior author on this paper that I helped him with. And these self-assembling um, nanofibers come um, at, at room temperature. They're in a, they're in a liquid uh, form. And then um, and body, they can be engineered such that, that at 37 degrees Celsius, at body temperature, they'll self-assemble and they'll form these nanofibers. Then you can engineer them to uh, express certain substrates like laminin, so they can be permissive to, uh, 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 to growth. And in, in addition, they're non-immunogenic, and in fact, as I'll show in a moment, they may actually modulate uh, the Im immunologic response. And so the, the technique that we used here was a, a clip compression uh, uh, model, which is the approach that, that we like in our lab and which, um, we, um, uh, with which we've collaborated here with the London 
a group. So this is just some proof of concept work. So this is FITSI labeled a, um, um, a QL6, which is what we call this particular nanofiber that we, that we work with. It distributes well in the cord, and um, it actually dramatically cuts down the glial scar. It doesn't work quite as well as chondroitinase, but it works quite well, and it's attractive. And we think this may um, act by attenuating inflammation, and that this may be the mechanism by which it attenuates the glial scar. This, this is just an, um, an, an IBA-1 uh, immunostate just showing about a 50% reduction in the inflammatory response, and it also is associated with a reduction in post-traumatic apoptosis. There is some degree of tissue sparing, and it also prevents a dieback of the cortical spinal tract. So this is anterograde labeling of BDA, which we dumped in the motor cortex, and we don't make claims that we're actually influencing uh, regeneration. I, I'm not convinced that we've shown that evidence, but I think we have quite persuasive evidence that it at least reduces the axonal degeneration that occurs, and this is just the quantification of this. We also have some retrograde um, fluorogold tracing, and so we do see an improvement in the integrity of, of axons. And we've done some electrophysiology now. This is in vivo electrophysiology, showing that we have improvement in motor conduction and the motor evoke potentials. And we um, also see some um, improvement in this in, in ex vivo slices. This is where we can take slices of the spinal cord, we can keep it alive in addition. We can <coughs> measure the um, compound action potential recordings, and we see, um, as you see there on the right, an improvement in the uh, cap. Uh, 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 amplitude, and we see some improvement as well in the high frequency conduction. So here we're looking at the refractory periods, and we're looking at the ability of these axons to follow high frequency trains of, of uh, stimulus. And we previously published on this as very sensitive electrophysiological techniques to assess the biophysical properties of these axons. And, and this does reflect the relative degree of myelination. It reflects other properties, but, but certainly it's a way to get a handle uh, on this, oh yeah, and it does improve behavior. This is the, the last, uh, kind of the last slide here. So this is work that's going to be coming out, um, I think, uh, probably early uh, in 2013 in, in publication. Um, we've now been switching to the to the cervical model, and um, and it's tough to do these studies. It's really tough to do these studies, but we have uh, developed an approach. Um, we we can injure. Um, cause injuries at C5, C6, and C7 levels with the CLIP, uh, with the CLIP model. And uh, we get uh, quite um, uh, consistent uh, lesions, and we are now starting to get some preliminary uh, results uh, with the use of neural stem cells. And these are some, um, uh, some pictures of, uh, of GFP-labeled neural stem cells in the, transplanted into the cervical cord. And uh, this is just some uh, initial work from Jared Wilcox, an MD-PhD student in my lab, showing that with this kind of an approach, we're seeing improvements in grip strength and upper extremity uh, function. And this is work um, uh, from one of uh, our electrophysiology postdocs just showing improvement in evoked potential recording. So just some initial work which suggests that we're seeing some uh, promising results in the cervical uh, model. And we're looking at different ways to try to to combine this with chondroitinase, and uh, so we, in collaboration with the Fawcett group, we're, we're using um, uh, a transfection approach to deliver um, a chondroitinase. And uh, then the final uh, piece I just wanted to, to share with you, and this is kind of a clinical a piece, and as a clinician scientist, I couldn't resist the, the temptation to, to show you a little bit of clinical trials uh, work. And this is um, really, I think, the, the clinical application of the, uh, the Novo Rho uh, story. And I think pretty much everybody is probably very familiar with this story, but we have these inhibitory molecules on the oligodendrocytes. These are heterogeneous, including Novo and other molecules that signal downstream through NGR and then downstream through Rho. And um, so I've had a collaboration with Lisa McCarricker, who we were talking about last night. Um, this morning at breakfast, we were talking about Lisa's work. So Lisa um, has developed an approach to inhibit Rho. And if you look at this, it makes sense to try to inhibit Rho. When you do this, you uh, reduce uh, post-traumatic cell death, but you also enhance plasticity and perhaps uh, regeneration. And I think this is a really promising strategy uh, that right now is kind of stuck 
between a promising phase one, two A study and phase three, and we can talk about the challenges with, with translation. But uh, Lisa developed a, a product um, that can be delivered uh, topically to the injured spinal cord. And so when as a surgeon I, I am operating on somebody, it's really tempting to try to apply something. And so this is kind of a cool approach. So this uh, recombinant um, a row protein inhibitor then is, is, is mixed in with a material called uh, tissial, which is a, um, a fibrin a sealant that's used routinely in neurosurgery. And it's not necessarily the best strategy, but it is a strategy that FDA could accept, as Tissial is FDA approved. And so we did a multi-center a, a trial. Again, this is published. I'll go through this very quickly. But um, you know, uh, this is a primarily a phase one study, since it's looking at safety and tolerability. But because we varied the doses and because we looked at different levels of injury, um, the pharma jing, uh, uh, li uh, lingo for this is, is a two-A study. In other words, we get some sense of, of dosing and we get some, a little bit of a sense of, of signal. And this is kind of a cool study to do because um, it was the first in man with a bioengineered strategy. We looked at people with a severe injury, so an Asia A uh, injury. We started in the thoracic group, but then we also varied the doses and then we moved into a cervical uh, uh, group. And, and uh, maybe that was a bit gutsy of us to do, but uh, we, we felt confident in the safety of this kind of an approach. And it would seem to work out okay. We applied this uh, between 24 to 48 hours after injury in most cases. And this is kind of an acute, a subacute type of a, of a treatment. And fortunately, there were no drug-related serious adverse events. But I want to tell you how difficult it is to do clinical trials, okay? And you know, you need to have really, really experienced centers. Because here's the reality. You have 48 patients, and you see that number? 450 adverse events. On average, every patient with a spinal cord injury has at least 10 serious adverse events. And there are two people that died, okay? Including one of my own uh, uh, patients. So this is, this is, you know, you're not kidding when you're doing these studies, right? You really, really have to know what you're doing. Uh, because this is uh, serious stuff. But in any event, uh, not, none of the deaths in the serious adverse events were directly related to, to Sethrin. Um, the first point I'm just going to make the, in a very important caveat is that this is not a randomized study and we don't really have a control group, okay? So, so with all of this, and this is really intended to give us a sense of signal, but there are some things here that are both sobering and encouraging. So first, the sobering result. The sobering result is that there's not a lot of signal in the thoracic cohort. And thoracic Asia A subjects are not the same as cervical Asia A subjects. It takes far less violence to cause a cervical spinal cord injury than a thoracic spinal cord injury. If somebody has a thoracic Asia A spinal cord injury, the spinal cord is absolutely pulverized. I hate to say that, but it's it, it's a different kettle of fish. And neuroprotective strategies may not be playing a big role there. The cervical region is different, though. And if you look at the 0.3 milligram cohort, the improvements that we see out to 52 weeks are very similar to the published data. So while this isn't really a control group in the strictest sense, we can kind of get a sense of what the spontaneous recovery might be. And this 3 milligram group looks very, very interesting. And although I did not report statistics in the published paper because I wanted to downplay this, I can tell you that if you do it, and it's very easy to do it, you can just do it yourself, do a t-test, and there are some interesting results there. So there's something there, we think, that is worth taking uh, forward. And this is looking at a different way. The conversion rates seem to be higher in this, in this group as well. So what does this mean for an individual with a spinal cord injury? Like, what does it mean? And um, you know, I'm showing you A to C. Like, what, is, what exactly does this mean? So this is a patient I looked after. Not the gentleman at the beginning that I described for you. Actually, he's an older individual. And he, but he also had a C4 level Asia A injury. So what this means is that this man could not even shrug his shoulders. He had difficulty even supporting his head, let alone like no use of his hands no ability to balance himself, no ability to transfer, a very, very difficult uh, situation. And he was also really sick, like he almost died. And we eventually got to operate on him in about five days. So this is what he looks like at a year. And, and I'll tell you firstly that he's still quite impaired. So there's no, but you'll see some of the interesting things 
with, the, with this. So the first thing you see is that he's got partial use of his hands. His hands are actually a bit clumsy and spastic, but he can actually feed himself. He's still largely wheelchair dependent for functional ambulation, but he's recovered partial use of his lower limbs. He does have spasticity. There's a bit of clonus that you see there for the clinicians in the audience. He has anti-gravity movement there in his legs, and you'll see importantly he can transfer. So this is a pretty big deal uh, for him to transfer. That's his son who's standing next to him, and he's going to help his dad stand, and he's, you'll see his dad standing in a minute, and he's actually now able to walk a bit uh, um, uh, with, with sticks. So far from you know, the, the cure, and I think the cure is a bit of a four-letter word if you want to think about it. We want, we're trying to help people. And even little things can help people. But it just kind of shows you maybe the things that are possible. So I think this is something that might be interesting, particularly in a combinatorial strategy. Again, if we start thinking about this, trying to overcome the inhibitory environment. OK. OK. And this is a publication. So really, in summary, what I've talked to you about um, is um, really the importance of the cervical injury, which is challenging for us to model the importance of the chronic lesion, and I've tried to talk to you about some of the promise of the use of neural stem cells, but I've also tried to be very realistic in terms of limitations and the potential appeal of using certain types of bioengineered strategies to target critical aspects of the lesion uh, pathobiology in a combinatorial approach. So I want to thank you uh, so much for the privilege of, of celebrating with Reggie today on this wonderful day. Questions? Sasha. Hi, it's a wonderful talk. Uh, nice review. I, I'm interested with this bioengineering approach with this matrix. And I'm wondering, going back to the work of Bill Blakemore and, and, and showing that basically if swan cells can't come in unless the astrocytes are not there. Is it that potentially, have you, have you noted whether these biomaterials restrict the entrance or scarring of astrocytes where it's allowing? The infiltration of these endogenous uh, lung cells, and that's what's mediated? There are several important facets to your question. So one of the implications, I think, is are, are, is it the astrocytes that are bad or are astrocytes good? So I think astrocytes are, are critical for the repair. Um, but there are certain elements of the, of the uh, uh, of the glial response, which are injured, which are damaging, and whether it's the pericyte that is the, is the critical player that contributes to the glial scar, uh, you know, as, as Friesen has suggested, we, we still need to sort out. But it's clear from Sofrenu's seminal work that if you knock the astrocytes out, that's terrible. So understanding the role of the astrocyte, I think, is really critical, we don't really understand fully the role of the astrocyte. Um, and then, to, so that's one element of this. And then, and then uh, of course, Mikhail Schwartz would argue that, that, that um, certain CSPGs actually are helpful. So I think the field is, is, you know, we have a very incomplete understanding of this, and there's a lot of further attention. But at a first blush, certainly the CSPGs appear to be damaging. And then, to what extent are we actually dealing with the influence of the cells that we put in versus the endogenous cells that we might stimulate versus, say, as you might be suggesting, say, the, the, the Schwann cell migration that might be occurring from the lesion? Um, I, I don't see in our, and we've studied um, the, uh, our, our, our tissues very carefully, I don't see an increase in the Schwann cell. Um, uh, uh, infiltrate. So my sense is that it's not that. However, um, I do think that the, uh, the relationship between the exogenous cells that are transplanted and the endogenous cells is a very interesting one, and it's one that we don't fully understand. And w w when you think about it, the survival of the cells that we transplant is relatively poor, <coughs> even in our best results. They're not they're not as uh, great. And, it, and, and one thinks about, well, okay, are we stimulating some kind of an endogenous response? And if so, if we understand that, could we actually 
stimulate that without the need to subject patients to a kind of a risky strategy with the transplantation itself. So I think that that would be, I think that that would be quite uh, uh, interesting, you know, to look at that endogenous uh, response. Realistically, though, the amount of endogenous response, you know, that say, you know, if we look at the number of all of endogenous oligodendroglial precursor cells that we stimulate, it's low, right? And so until we actually can amplify that response, unfortunately, we are going to be looking at some kind of an exogenous um, strategy. So I've probably answered your question with more questions, but you have hit several points that I think are very, are very, are very important. And it just follows up on what our conversation this morning that although you know, I am in support of a limited number of clinical trials moving forward in the field, and I've discussed this, that, that, it's, that it's really, these trials should be done very limited and that we need a very rigorous preclinical strategy to, to target this. And like all the things that you've indicated are things we don't know. I'm curious, I mean, I'm very intrigued by the separate data. Um, so far we have only historical cohorts, but you did a Staskis trial. And in that Staskis trial, you have also very high conversion rates. I think 37%, 42%. If you could compare those conversion rates to your Cetrin data, how would the Cetrin study conversion rate compare to the one in the Staskis trial? Right, so, uh, so, so Wolfram has is, is alluded to, so this is a problem when you publish work that people get to cite your work, and then it's a very good question. So the Staskis is, the, uh, is, a, is a trial that I led, and it's, it's a surgical timing and acute spinal cord <coughs> study. And uh, essentially, um, the hypothesis that I pursued was that if the spinal cord is squished and the spinal column is broken, it probably makes sense to fix the broken spinal column and to de-squish the cord. And if you're going to do it, you should probably do it sooner rather than later. And that was actually considered heresy when I proposed this. In fact, I got hauled in front of the dean's office. This is a true story. I got hauled in front of the dean's office in 1992 when I first, uh, it first became apparent that I was operating on people with spinal cord injuries in Toronto, and I was told, that's not what we do in Toronto. So it was an interesting <laughs> discussion <laughs> and, um, in any event. But what we showed in the study was that if you do this and you, and you apply um, uh, appropriate uh, intensive management of patients, that you get improvement. And, and um, so the conversion rates that you're seeing were higher. Okay, now the question then that, that Wolf was asking me was, okay, then how do these separate data compare if you see higher rates of conversion that have been historically um, uh, uh, published? Really yeah, nice. okay, 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 but, 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 okay, so here's where I was, back. okay, I want to, I have to qualify this now, okay. So, first point I said was, that I, that, you know, when we were looking at the, at the results, I was comparing it to the 0.3 milligram group, which is not a perfect control. So I, I think this is the whole problem with the use of historical cohorts. They're historical cohorts, right? And so, you know, what do you choose and when do you choose, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very difficult to compare a study where the, the, the drug was being applied on average 24 to 48 hours afterwards with a study of such as Staskis where the when early surgery on average was 12 to 14 hours after the injury. So the different groups, and you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't compare them. I wouldn't compare them at all. So they're really, it's, it's heterogeneous. I think the one is the one, the one is the other. But I think what, um, what, what Staskis has shown us is that anybody who designs a clinical trial needs to um, really consider all of the acute variables. And, and, and also, all of the studies that, that, that we have been reporting on, the cord is decompressed, whether it's a weight drop model or the clip model, to decompress the cord, right? We would never, like, I, I mean, it would be interesting, I guess, to leave the weight on in some way and to leave the clip on, but we don't do that. And yet, this is what's been happening in the clinic, right? And so I think we need to control for it. And, and there is a higher rate of conversion that we've been previously uh, used to. And um, so it's interesting, it's interesting. But I, I, I would be the first 
to be cautious about using historical uh, uh, cohorts. And I, I, I hope that you would agree that I was appropriately conservative with the way that the, that the uh, Sethrin data were reported. But I want to go on with the Sethrin question a little bit. Um, you apply it very acutely, but it's thought to be a pro-regenerative strategy. So how long does it last? You also use the word for protection. So what does it do and when does it do it and how long does it last? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so see, I knew I was, I, see, I, I, I didn't have the, the Sethrin slides in there, and I thought, oh, you know, I can't give this talk without showing the Sethrin. I just can't, I just couldn't resist. So I'm glad I showed it, because it, it, it's always cool to talk about things that go into, into, the, into the clinic. Okay, so, um, you know, the original, uh, you know, if you look at the animal models uh, and the initial reports, <coughs> They're all focused on long tracked axonal regeneration. You know, when you look at the pictures and they show like one or two axons, and this is supposed to mediate the recovery. And that, that never made sense to me. I don't know about you, but it never made sense to me. So probably there's not much of an effect on axonal regeneration. It's probably more related to plasticity. There is some evidence there. Um, I think it needs to be studied further to actually corroborate that. And there's some evidence in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, in terms of the the, the influence on, on apoptosis, um, the um, there is some sense from the phase one two a study that the patients that received that within the first seventy two hours did better than the ones that got it a bit that got it a bit, a bit later. And if it moves forward, we'll probably do this with about a three hour time with not three hour three day a three day time window. Um, the, for various uh, reasons, the preclinical development with saccharin is kind of stopped, um, and it needs to be studied further because there are think, critical things that we don't understand about this. Um, so I would be very interested to see, to actually define the effects on, on, plas on plasticity. But I don't, um, I'm not as persuaded by the evidence on long tract axonal regeneration at all. I think that it's probably more, I think the whole no-go story, in my view, I'd be interested in what, what Reggie thinks about this, but I think it's more of a plasticity story and kind of potentially effects on appropriate spinal circuits, et cetera, et cetera. All right, Arthur, last one. Last one. So just to follow up on this, it occurs to me sitting here that one strategy would be not to apply septum at the site of the lesion, but to go up at, at the long descending spinals or below the lesion as a way to increase that plasticity and so you can be doing surgery far away from the vulnerable sites and maybe get into this plasticity. Well that's an interesting well that's an interesting thought. Okay, so in terms of trying to influence then the, the Yeah, I know that I agree with you. I don't believe in the long term <coughs> necessarily regeneration as a strategy, but maybe it's with this it's diffusing a little bit, and you're getting some local if you've actually applied it to increase that that type of plasticity, then it might be, in, in some ways, a better surgery and more successful. Okay, well, that's, um, I have to think about that one. So I think that's an, inter it's an interesting, interesting thought. You probably make arguments one way, one way um, or, or another. Although I will say that there is, a, I think a lot of people in the field right now are interested in the effects remote from the lesion, in particular, the effects in the lumbar circuitry related to the cervical lesions. I, I guess I st still think it probably makes the most sense to apply it locally, but I acknowledge the point you're making because there are important distal effects and, um, um, and certainly if you consider the work, I think Reggie would probably talk about some of the interesting electrical stimulation work that we're doing there distally. It, it, you know, there, there certainly is potentially an opportunity to, uh, uh, to apply your thought. Good, good, good question to end before lunch. All right. So, Scott.